Assalamualaikum and welcome to a very wet Johannesburg. We've been blessed with marvelous rain uh, throughout the night, and uh, it, the weather people tell us that we will be getting some more rain throughout the week. So we're very, very grateful for that. But we do continue to make dua that the rains go down south to the Western Cape. We know that they are in a dire situation, and uh, it seems as if day zero for the Western Cape, as far as the water situation is concerned is literally around the corner so let us all put our hands together and pray for much 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 needed rain in that part of the world but I'd like to welcome you to the show this morning this is let's talk with me Julie Ali we are together till 10 o'clock and as always we have a whole host of fun stuff serious stuff and interesting stuff coming your way we'll be looking at the history of Jerusalem with a Sheikh Dr. Samir Saeed and Jerusalem has been in the world spotlight recently so we're deciding to take a look at the history of Jerusalem, a city which is truly close to all of our hearts. Then we're going to be looking at university life. Is your loved one, is your child, is your little darling going to start uni for the first time this year? While well, both you and your child are going to have to do lots of adjustments. I think the parting and then of course the easing into university life is pretty tough, not only on them, but on you as a parent as well. We're going to talk to a doctor from Wits who's going to tell us just how you ease into university life. But the fun stuff comes up right now. We're going to be talking Lego, and we know that Lego is the fun stuff. It's kids um, playing equipment or toys, but it's the type of toys that we all want our kids to be exposed to because it has a very strong educational element to it and of course a bonding element as well so lego is what we kick off with this morning with wayne smith who is somewhat of a specialist as far as lego is concerned wayne morning welcome to the program thank you very much julie for having us on the show um we really thank you guys for having us and getting this opportunity to speak to you about the hobby that we love Sorry, I said Wayne, but it's Michael. It's Michael, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, uh, lovely to have you here. And I'm hoping that the guys um, in the production room uh, in the studio is going to give us a long shot or a wide shot of this amazing um, display that we have here. And it's all thanks to you and your team. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, the winter set that we've uh, put together for you guys today is a theme that... Uh, kids can just play with and uh, it's a really educational uh, uh, set that people can just interact and have a lot of playability and um and the kids can just, the imagination just flow playing with the set. They can run absolutely they wild. Can go crazy. We're going to come back uh, throughout the interview to different parts of what we have here on display. Uh, and I also understand that you very kindly have, uh, are going to do a giveaway on the show. Absolutely, yes. What exactly is that? Um, we've got a prize sponsored uh, for the show, and we'll have a little bit of a competition where you guys can either um, email us with uh, the word Lego uh, to info at jhblug.co.za and at the end of the show we'll, have, we'll give a prize to the value of about a thousand rand oh, wow. uh, to, to one lucky viewer. Perfect. So there you have it. Participate, be a part of the conversation this morning, very especially on this part of the show. We're talking Lego, we're talking about the importance of Lego as an educational tool and also a bonding tool between you and your loved one, your little, your little darlings. And if you do stay tuned, we're going to ask a question and hopefully you can walk away with that prize, which is valued at a thousand rands. Now back to you, Michael, and where and how did this all start for you? Look, Lego started for, for me um, when my son was born. Um, little Aiden was born in 26 November 2009. And um, we started collecting a little bit of sets here and there. And then 
uh, for his third birthday, we had a Lego party and the family oh, just... Oh, wow. What's a Lego party? A Lego party is just the theme that we chose. Um, and we were... We had a... I, I can't even remember the amount of Lego that we got from the party. And as we So start, was every child meant to bring a piece of Lego as a birthday present? The, the, the birthday presents were mostly Lego. Okay. So we, we took the Lego and we started building it and um, we started playing with the stuff and, and we just saw that there's a bond between me and my son um, that, that was... So you didn't grow up building Lego. You were not exposed to Lego as a child. No, we weren't exposed to Lego as a child. Um, uh, when we were children, we played with little stick cars and uh, played in, in the mud and <laughs> the conventional way of kids play. Played in the streets. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and then... Uh, Lego only, I only got involved with Lego when my son was born. And how long ago was that? Um, about eight years ago. Okay. And um, seriously got into the hobby when he was about three, so about five years now. Okay. You got so hooked to the world of Lego that you've gone on to form a club, a Lego club. Tell us about it. Look, the Lego club is a club uh, called the JHB Lug. Um, the JHB Lug is a club that of, it's a club where like-minded enthusiasts like myself and Jason um, can sit down with our kids and have fun building stuff together with your kids. Uh, what we also do is we do exhibits at, uh, at uh, schools, um, public places, uh, malls and stuff like that. Uh, of the local one that we have now on the 3rd of February is the Maragon event, which is a phenomenal event. Um, we, we host, uh, Maragon's the host, we're the presenters of the, of the expo. Um, and it's just a place where we can take the, the, the brick and take it to a place and get the public involved and see that father and son, mommy and, and, and daughter can actually take something and put something presentable on the table and have fun with it. And have one or two fun time, fun quality time with your children or your family. Now when you talk about all of these events that you go and display your Lego pieces at or your creations yes. out of Lego, there's nothing in it for you, no financial gain at all. No, there's no financial gain for us. We do it for the love of the brick. Um, our slogan is building the community brick by brick. Um, so we would like to go out and just promote uh, the togetherness of, of, of the family, like a daddy and a, and a son, playing with a brick together and just having fun and, and creating things and, you know, having fun with, the, with what he's built. How much of time are you investing in Lego? And I mean, what's your real job anyway? Because when I look at all of these creations, I know that this has entailed hours and hours and hours of work. Mm. Um, my one fear is, and I'm that type of person, after I've looked at something like that, I, I will then demolish it. Mm. But I know how much of work has gone into this. So how much of time do you invest in this hobby or activity of yours? Look, to answer your question, I've, I do have a real job. It has to pay for the Lego somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've, got a real, I've got a company that I own. Um, and the time I invest into the hobby is, is let's say, about five to six hours a day. Um, after I'm, I come home from my real job, I would spend some time with the kids, building something, playing with them and interacting with them and doing a little bit of a letting our creations um, you know, we have fun with your creations. Now, we know as parents with our children, we allow X amount of playtime um, during the day, whether mm. it's a school day or a weekend. Mm. So, you know, you try and work around some sort of a system or a calendar with your children. Mm. Do you do that with them with Lego as well? Because we know Lego, unlike other type of playtime or toys is very educational. I've been told, and you can correct me here, I've mm. been told that it also helps you build um, analytical skills, logical skills, logical thinking, etc. Yes. Would you agree with that? And because of those elements <coughs> in place, um, do you kind of allow more playtime when your children are involved in Lego? Yeah. Look, um, when, when Aiden gets home from school, there's basic things that he has to do. He has to sit down in the afternoon, have his, his lunch, and uh, then start off with homework, of course. Um, when the homework's done, he can sit and go build something. And we, 
we really like to push the, the Lego boundary, uh, letting him play freely with the Lego because there's lots of things that Lego help with. One major thing is concentration, um, um, mathematical skills, um, fine motor skills, uh, creative thinking, um, just general stuff that, that helps kids daily opposed to a TV game where he sits and you know, has to kill someone on the TV, which is, which is not right for us. Mindless. Mindless, ab absolutely. Uh -huh. So we encourage positive thinking through, through the Lego and letting him play and create something. And who knows, he might become an engineer one day because the foundation of Lego is, great, is a great starting tool to becoming something like an engineer one day. Okay. However, Lego is a very expensive hobby. I mean, it does cost quite a bit as opposed to other yes. plastic toys or anything else, um, you know, that is uh, taking the kiddies' toy world by storm. Mm. Lego is expensive. Mm. Um, do you have clubs where you kind of exchange or how do you support each other? Look, within the Joba Club, we've got many WhatsApp groups and, and communication between members where members can swap out Lego pieces. For instance, let's, um, someone needs a tile or a, a certain type of block that he needs. He can then go into our group and say, look, guys, I need this type of block. How do I, is anybody willing to trade me for this block? And we can, we can trade internally with the, within the members. So yes, we can change and swap bricks with one another, which is great. My kids too uh, grew up on Lego, <coughs> but I can't say that my hubby or I were vested as much as you are. Um, and we still have a huge bucket full of Lego and I've kind of been thinking of giving it away. Mm. Um, but as I speak with you, I realize the value of the Lego. Mm. But I'm going back many years. Is the Lego that I have, which is probably 20 odd years old, still can still be used today and be matched up with newer and designs and newer pieces. Absolutely. The first uh, a fun fact about Lego is the first block of Lego that was made thousands, hundreds of years ago can still fit on today's sets. So the blocks never changed. The, the design of the block never changed. Brick in 1960 would fit on a block of 2018. So there's, there's no difference. So the blocks that you have that you played with as a kid um, will still fit on the, to, on the stuff of today. So unlike other toys, you don't throw it out, you don't, you, no. you, you, you don't forget about it. You kind of pass it down from you, generation to generation. Yes, That's what most... It's valuable, isn't yes. it? Most, most people that I know you know, within our club are, are guys that, um, that have passed um, uh, Lego down from generation to generation. And uh, these guys really, they look after it and um, they treasure it because um, it does become valuable at the end of the day. Okay, we need to take an ad break now. Awesome. When we get back, we're going to talk about each individual piece. We're going awesome. to talk about how long it took to put it together. And I know there's a story behind each piece. So let's look at that. I'm talking to uh, Michael Smith. He's with the Johannesburg um, Lego Club. He's going to give us all of those details a little later on. He is a Lego enthusiast together with his children and all his cronies. They're all hooked to Lego. We're talking about the uh, beauty of this toy, if that is what we can refer to it. This toy which does bring families together and as you've heard Michael has indicated that obviously there's a lot of benefits if you expose your child, your children or your family to the world of Lego. We are waiting to hear from you. There's a prize on giveaway this morning, compliments of the Lego Club. It's worth about a thousand rands. All you need to do is just call in, tell us a little bit about Lego, whether you like it, don't like it. Are you an enthusiast? And you stand a chance to win a Lego set valued at about a thousand rand. So don't go away. Still more to come from the world or the land of Lego.
Welcome back. Still to come on the show, we're going to be looking at uh, Jerusalem, the history of Jerusalem, and we're also going to help you ease your children into uni life. So a doctor from Wits is going to be joining us and telling us about the do's and don'ts and all of the challenges that first year students at university will be facing and how to help them navigate their way around uni life. But right now it's the fun stuff, it's Lego. And I promise you, for me, it feels like I've been transported into Lego land. Uh, my production team and of course, Wayne and his friend Jason were busy and furiously working this morning to give us this amazing display. And I do hope, yes, of course, there you've got a very wide shot. And um, it's a pity the kids are at school already because had they been at home, they'd be squealing with absolute delight at the amazing stuff we have here. Now, just off air we spoke about the monetary element and I guess with any and every hobby um, there is um, a monetary value attached but with something like this you can't even think about the monetary value mm. because of the hours of pleasure the hours of quality bonding time with your loved ones would I be correct absolutely um, we, we as a club we try and take out the money elements first out of the out of the hobby and try and concentrate on things like uh, the time it took me to me and my son to build this uh, this model and I guess every piece tells a story absolutely there's a um, <coughs> different um, type of builds that we've done here for you guys today and every single one of them tell a different story and especially for you on a personal level obviously when you sit down and build something with your son in the process of that build uh, depends how long it takes it could be half an hour it could be three hours it could be three days there's something happening between you and your son <coughs> because you start out with an idea you discuss it and as you go along it might change along the way mm. but a lot of other life skills are being parted you empowering your son a lot of things maybe ordinarily he wouldn't be talking to you about stuff that happened at school or with a friend or whatever have you and this is the time when all of that gets unpacked mm, absolutely the, the, the main thing about building Lego together is to create a bond with my son and with my daughter um, wh whilst we're building we're creating and sharing something which is very valuable to me and it's quality time um, sitting together we create friend, we also create a, um, we're building a friendship so in later in life when he comes when when there are struggles that come across his way he can come to me freely and say you know daddy this is the problem how do i deal with this issue and there'll be a bond and there'll be a foundation laid where he can talk freely to me and i can talk freely to him Absolutely. Okay, just a reminder to our viewers, we are giving away a prize on this part of the show this morning. It's a Lego set um, or a couple of pieces valued at a thousand rand. So if you call in and um, we're not going to ask you any tough questions, you can just tell us what you think about the show perhaps or if Lego features in the lives of your children and yourself. So lines are open, please give us a call. Let's get to the interesting and exciting stuff now. Let's Let's start talking about everything that's been uh, built here. Is that is that the terminology? Do yes. you build Lego? Um, yes, Lego has been built. Um, if, firstly, it gets designed. Um, the idea gets put to paper. Um, once the idea gets put to paper, you've got an idea of what you want to build. You do you have to put everything, do you have to sketch everything? Does it have to be in paper or can you just kind of build out just, of your head? You can build out of your head. Um, I, at, in our house, we promote free thinking. Um, so build out of what you feel you want to build. So if you want to build a street vendor or something in the street um, where someone's selling something, go ahead and go build it and put it on your display. So I promote free thinking. Other people, um, they would uh, put pen to paper. And that's okay, that's isn't okay. it? That's um, mm. okay. It's, it's encouraging to, to know that people can plan something and then execute that plan into something like this. You've told me that you have shows and ex uh, exhibitions all around yes. uh, Gauteng, probably even beyond. But do you ever have Lego competitions? Yes, we've got lots of internal little competitions amongst our members where we create, where we, um, we call them mock uh, competitions. So that's my own creation. So you would take a whole bunch of bricks, 
you put it together and build something that you out of your mind or something that you put to paper and we'll judge we'll see how how technical that build is and how how much thinking and creative thinking has gone into the build and then we'd pick a winner wow and i have no doubt there must be amazing talent and creativity that comes out of these competitions absolutely our club is blessed with lots and lots of uh, uh, lots of talent um, I always give lots of credit to our main, uh, our main expert, who's Jason Datnow. Um, Jason, who's standing in the wings and didn't want to wing. join us on set this morning. Okay. <laughs> Jason, uh, all these sets have been built by Jason. Um, Jason is a fabulous guy. He, um, he really looks after our club and he's, he, he really has taken our club under his wing. As the expert and the most experienced person in our club, he is really helpful and teaches and educates all along the way so big props to all Jason. right let's talk about this um, amazing dome-like structure that we have here is it okay to pick it up absolutely oh my word it. it's getting bigger as I lift it the, is the, that the idea that's the idea the okay. idea came from this little ball um, which is called a Hoverman sphere mm -hmm. um, opening and closing and Jason decided to take this little model and put it into something Lego. So that's, that's when this creation was, was okay. built. So it goes quite big. And it does exactly the same as the little ball. Okay. To give you an idea about... How long? <laughs> this looks very intricate. How long did it take to put this together? And this, this doesn't look like your regular Lego pieces. It, it kind of looks different. Why? Look, there's different pieces in Lego. This is called a technique piece. Um, so this is built out of technique because it's very movable. Um, Jason took about two weeks, uh, two months to design this, oh. and the, the physical building of it took about a, a day or two. Amazing. To actually Absolutely put the thing amazing. together, which is very gorgeous. Simple. The, the, the putting it together is the easy part. The design concept, concept, concept yeah. about every mo moving part working mm -hmm. together in unison is the is where the how the long work. would you hold onto a piece like this show it off to your friends family etc and then the hard part or the easy part is to demolish it would you do that yes. wouldn't it break your heart look uh, we generally keep, hold on to <laughs> models for two or three shows and then after the show it gets broken down um, we don't see it as a breaking our heart build breaking down models because we know that something better would be created afterwards okay Believe it or not, we've only got two minutes to wrap up. So just take us through this very quickly, very especially the Minion. That's a great favorite of lots of kiddies. Absolutely. The Minion is a big favorite. It's a big showstop at our events. Um, the Minion, absolutely wonderful. The Minion took about, it's got about 2,000 bricks in it. Um, took about a, a weekend to build, Jason said. But the hard part is probably the top, which is, which takes some time. And then we've got the South African flag. Um, as our club is, um, you know, tr proudly South African club, we'll, uh, Jason and his son bought that, you know, on a weekend. And then lastly, the big set that we have here. Uh, was this built in, um, in kind of differently by different people or was it Jason and his son? Jason and his son bought How this. long did it take to, this is, uh, looks to me like a snow ski resort type of thing. It's a Christmas scene. That's the one. That's mm -hmm. exactly what it is. So you, there's different, these are sets that you can buy in the shop, um, toyadventures.ca.za. They've got all these sets on their, on their website. Um, you, you buy the set, you build a theme around it and then place your models down and, and then you've got a little, you've got a theme um, sitting out and you can play with it then. So, and you can chop and change as you like. Absolutely. If you'd like to take off the house, you can just take off the house and build another house there. Mm -hmm. Or you can build another shop there or something like that. And just uh, let your imagination flow. Run wild. Run, run wild. Okay, so we're wrapping up now. Why, you know, your message to families out there, why do you believe they should get involved <coughs> with Lego as a hobby? Look, Lego is, is more than a toy for us. Um, it's become a tool that we empowering our kids to become something better. Um, it's created a bond between me and my son, which is, there's no, you can't put any money to it. No, you can't. Um, and also the fun aspect of the whole thing, um, opposed to kids sitting in front of TV games, violent TV games and 
playstations and whatever you want to or call it. Or just be exposed to any other social evil. Wrap up Absolutely. time. Thank you indeed for being with us. Thank you for bringing a little bit of magic into our lives this morning. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you. And I have no doubt that people are going to get hooked into or perhaps consider this as an alternative to other toys. Um, you very kindly offered to give away prize. Tell us a little bit about it. I've just been told by my producers that the winner of the prize is someone called um, Amina Sharif from Azadville. Thank you for calling in. You are the lucky winner of um, uh, a Lego prize worth a thousand rands. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about awesome. the prize? The prize is a, is a three-in-one creator set. Um, the set is, is a good starting point. The, the prize was proudly sponsored by someone that's dear to us, Toy Adventures. Uh, toyadventures.ca.za um, the, the set uh, please go enjoy the set and <laughs> add on to the set and Absolutely. start being creative I just need to end by saying thank you very much for coming in and I'm really sad that this is going to be going away with you I'd have loved this to have become <laughs> part of my permanent set but thank you so much for bringing a bit of fun and magic into our lives this Wednesday morning go well and may many 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 people watching us this morning embrace Lego full heartedly awesome thank you very much for the opportunity my pleasure entirely that was of course Michael Smith um, a lover a hobbyist of Lego Lego and you've heard that unlike other toys that we get tired of and then just discard um, Lego is something that you can keep for the rest of your life you can pass it down from generation to generation and you can of course bond with your loved ones this is one type of toy one possibly of um, there, there, there might be others on the market as well but this very definitely is a type of toy that uh, entire families and communities can get involved in. So perhaps you want to think very carefully the next time you expose your children to toys and gifts, this is what you should be thinking along. Still to come, we're going to talk about Juni life and we're also going to be looking at the history of Jerusalem. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back. We are now going to be talking about Jerusalem. And as we know, Donald Trump made that ridiculous, outrageous statement a little while ago, suggesting that Jerusalem should become or should be the new capital of Israel. And of course, there was outrage all around the world. And Alhamdulillah, we have two guests, the one from Palestine. He is a Sheikh, Dr. Samir Said, and a Turkish gentleman who's come along to help us with translation. We hope that nothing is going to be lost in translation. And Sheikh is going to talk to us about the history of Jerusalem. On the one hand, you get the Jewish or the Zionists claiming uh, that Jerusalem and the Holy Land uh, around Jerusalem belongs to them. But we as Muslims know that we have a very strong historical link to Jerusalem as well, in the way, of course, of Al-Quds and Al-Aqsa. And we also know, of course, that miraculous journey was taken by our beloved Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Mirage from Mecca to Jerusalem, and then, of course, uh, the miraculous journey. So we have in studio with us uh, the Sheikh, Sheikh Dr. Samir Said, to talk about the history of Jerusalem. Salaamu Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. You are a Palestinian brother. Yes. This is, this is something that's very close to your heart. Yes. Yani, we, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, first, I want to thank for all of you in this country of South Africa. Uh, the second thing we are talking about the Holy Land. Holy Land is mean for all the Muslims in the world and for all the humanity peoples there. Because we have many challengers there, challenge in Al-Quds now. Uh, about that we are must talking about this challenge, what's the way? And about the historic, uh, historical thing what you tell, uh, tell about that, we are talking about Ardul Anbiya. It's the land of Anbiya. All the prophets in all the world, they are coming, they are sitting in the Al-Quds. Nabiullah Ibrahim, wa qablahu Adam, thumma Ibrahim, Ishaq, wa Yaqub, thumma Nabiullah Dawood, wa Sulaiman, wa Musa. Musa is, Nabiullah Musa, it's not arrived to Al-Quds. He is outside. 
and he's die in Sina. It's not he's die in Sina. After that, they uh, t uh, take him beside Al Quds, his grave. It's mm -hmm. beside Al Quds, mm -hmm. not in there. Also, Nabiullah Yusuf alayhi salam, he, he's die in Egypt, but he put in Wasiya. You translate me to Al Quds. Also, Nabiullah Yusuf. I want Yusuf, to be buried in yes, at Al Quds. Yes, uh, yes. They transfer him after he's die there to Al Quds. Uh, it's uh, Musa alayhi salam. He's taking the grave of Yusuf with him. And in the tea, you need the tea in uh, uh, Sina, 40 years they are tea. Uh, Nabiullah Musa die, Harun die in this time. After that, they take Yusuf to the Al Quds. Also, Nabiullah uh, Isa, he's there. Kanisatul uh, Mahd in Beit Lahm, uh, he's born there. Uh, also, all the people in all the world, they are looking for. Al-Quds and Al-Masjid, Al-Aqsa, Al-Mubarak. And this, it's come uh, also in Al-Isra wal miraj Nabiullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the last thing, and the last ayah in Quran, it's coming for Al-Quds, Subhanallah, asra bi abdihi laylam, min al-Masjid al-Haram, ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Uh, then, al Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's coming from Mecca to Al-Quds, and Miraj, it's putting their stair on the rock to Al-Sama. Mm. Then we said, this is the gate of the earth, it's from Al-Quds. Okay. Uh, welcome, brother. Salam. Nice Your interest with uh, the Sheikh, um, you are um, Turkish. Yeah. You come from Turkey. Yeah. Um, do you work closely with the Sheikh? And where do you fit into the picture of the history of Jerusalem? Actually, we, uh, we came, came here, South Africa to give awareness and education about Al-Quds and equip the pupil, uh, all of the pupil, maybe they are uh, 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 youth and they are women, they are uh, engineer, doctors. We want to know how problem facing our brother in Palestine, how they are challenges facing. That's why we came here and uh, Dr. Saeed and me to work on this issue. Alhamdulillah, I'm sure you are aware that we have many um, groups in South Africa that are very pro-Palestine. Um, we are always in the forefront of all sorts of marches and fundraising, etc., for the Palestinian people. So we do do our bit to create uh, the awareness of the hardship of the Palestinian people. We know that even if you are born and brought up in Palestine, that access, depending where in Palestine you live, that access is denied to you to go to pray in the, in the mosque. Uh, so we are aware of all of that. Um, your response or the challenge to Donald Trump's outrageous mm. comments that, um, that uh, Jerusalem should become the capital of Israel. How are people responding and what are you doing about it to make the rest of the world, apart from Muslims, because we are very sensitive and sensitized to this issue, but non-Muslims, how should they understand this narrative about Jerusalem uh, or our Quds being a very holy site for Muslim people as well? You see, Trump, when he said this thing for him, he's, he didn't have a right for that. Why you do that? Uh, and also these people, in, uh, they are arrested us in Palestine. Also, they didn't have this right also, Palestine, it's for Palestinian people and for, and anyone we can, we can live together there. Uh, this Trump now, all Palestinian people there, they are going to Mudaharat. يعني خرجوا إلى المظاهرات في الشوارع وخالفوا قرار ترامب وحتى على المستوى الدولي وكل الدول في كل أوروبا وأمريكا وكل الأماكن خرجوا في مظاهرات after the Trump decision, all the world stand by Palestine, and they are all against this uh, decision. This is not only Muslim people, 
Palestinian people, all the countries, all uh, uh, yani, uh, common uh, idea, all the against uh, uh, Trump uh, decision. And, and never, nobody can accept this uh, decision. كذلك أهل القدس خرجوا كاملة مخالفة لقرار ترامب لأنهم أصحاب الأرض نحن نمتلك الأرض من مئات السنين ونحن أصحابها وفي عام 1948 احتلت القدس واحتلت فلسطين بالاحتلال الإسرائيلي الذي جاء وأخذ كل الأرض وأخذ كل شيء We as Palestinian people we against this decision and we go out to strike about this uh, decision and we never accept this is our land and this is our land from uh, uh, old any time and uh, also they occupied our land we we never accept this but despite, yes. despite that, Muff, despite that, when we look at the history of Jerusalem, we go back uh, a couple of hundred years or even thousands of years. We know that whenever <clears throat> the Muslims were ruling in that part of the world, never did a Muslim prevent the Christian or the Jewish people from worshipping at the holy site. Never ever in the history yes, of yes. Jerusalem, mm. despite all the hardship that is being placed on uh, current day Palestinian people, go back and we challenge anybody, any historical, uh, anybody studying history, go into the history of Jerusalem and over the hundreds and thousands of years of wars, whenever, even if it was the Ottoman Empire, whoever it was that was in power, as Muslims, they never prevented non Muslims from worshipping. Up till now, the relation between us and the Christian people in Al Quds, it's very nice, it's okay. Because, uh, but their uh, re, 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 uh, Sohyoniya, what's the meaning of it? The Zionist. 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 This is the difficult thing, what uh, it's there. It's against us, Muslims and the Christian. And we, uh, before coming Nabiuna Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when that time is Umar bin Khattab, he's going there, there is a uh, ittifaq between Christian and Muslims. And they make a deal in that time. And Umar al-Khattab is taking the keys of Al-Quds from Christian people. And they allowed. And there is uh, wasp for Umar in the holy book uh, there. Uh, and they said, yes, you are the man who is taking the key. OK, we will give you the key of Al-Quds in that time. And we, there is a life there and good life together. In that time, up till now, they are taking also some uh, Christian people by force. They are uh, living there, and many things it's happened against us, and challenges there. It's for us and for Christian inside Al Quds. It's the same. About that, we are must st stand together to uh, this to remove this occupation about Al Quds and then Masjid Al Aqsa Al Mubarak. All right, let's take an ad break. We'll be back with you in a minute or two. I'm talking to Sheikh Dr. Samir Saeed, talking about the history of Jerusalem. It's a pity we don't have enough time. There's just so much more we could uncover on the show this morning. But let's see how we continue with this discussion after the ad break. Well... Welcome back. We're talking about the history of Jerusalem and sadly I don't think we're going to have enough time to go into as much detail as we'd like to. My guest is Sheikh Dr. Samir Saeed. He comes from a background, he studied as a pharmacist but is now lecturing all around. He's bringing the story of the true history of Jerusalem to the people. Sheikh, you are now busy bringing the story of the true Jerusalem, the history of Jerusalem to the people. How are people responding? At especially the young people of Palestine? Mm -hmm. uh, you see, we have many challenges there. First thing, education. If we are talking about the education, we have in uh, J uh, Jerusalem 400,000 people, they are live inside. From that 100,000 people, they are, stu stu they are students. These students, we do need uh, 19,000 uh, class we need in Al-Quds. They are without, without schools. 
they are sometimes in the hall, they're making the a class. In the kitchen, they're making a class. In the entrance, they're making a class. A class. Like that, we have this challenge in education in Al-Quds. Also, some people, uh, like uh, one man, one story, he's Rasab, Rasab Sana Sanawat. They fell in, uh, in they fail class. They fell in class seven years in the secondary school, the third secondary school, because the Israeli people, they catch him before they arrest him before one week from uh, examination. Every year they prevent him to enter examination. So Seven they targeted years. him all the time to prevent him from Preventing qualifying. Preventing the people uh, in this time. Mm -hmm. Second thing, the apartheid there, it's coming, there is a, a, a gates. In this gates, the school in one side and the teacher in the other side. And the uh, student in one side and the school in the other side. These things, uh, they make uh, 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 for them Tasrih, we call. What's the meaning of Tasrih? Very permission. difficult. Yes. Permission. Oh. No, permission. Permission. They give permission, 12 kinds. Permission, they're giving to these people. They are living inside the wall and uh, outside the wall. They cannot enter. This uh, teacher, he take a permission. When he's enter in that day, okay, in the night, if they show him in Al-Quds, in the night, they arrest him. Because this... Uh, uh, Permission. permission. It's for morning, not for night. So like they that. do. So the occupiers, the Zionist occupiers, will do anything and everything to make the life of the Palestinians as difficult as possible. It's very difficult. They are hoping that you will leave the land and go away. But obviously, you're made of stronger stuff than that. It's important for Palestinians to stay put and fight for what is rightfully theirs, and that is the land of Palestine. Do you believe that you can reach some sort of some sort of compromise with the occupiers so that you can live in peace and harmony? Uh, you, uh, is uh, there is no no peace with uh, these people. No peace. What's this peace? It's apartheid. You know, South African peoples, they know what's the meaning of apartheid. This is, it's very difficult life we, 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 would, we are it's, living It's a hundred times worse than what we were uh, subjected to. Yes. Yani now, fines. Everything they do in Al-Quds, they make fines against us. Student fines, they put fines. Teachers, they put fines. Any decide against any Palestinian, they put fines against him. This is... In uh, 2015, 10 million fines against these people by easy thing. They are not doing anything. Also about the, our flats. Anyone who is sitting in Al-Quds, before 1948, he must take a license for his home. You see, what's this? This is from where they bring this one. They are coming, they are occupying us, and we are the owner. They want, after they are occupied us, they want to make license from them. About this license, anyone who wants a license for the home or his house, he needs 10 years for bringing the uh, 10 years. Also, he wants $200,000 for license. Undoubtedly, the Zionist occupiers are going to do everything in their power to make the life of the Palestinians as difficult as possible in the hope that you guys, the Palestinians, will leave the country and go away and then they can grab. They've already grabbed 90% or more of the country. They are doing worse than what the Nazis did to the Jewish people in the Second World War. They're doing much, much worse. Um, do you believe by doing what they're doing, they are changing the history of Jerusalem and Palestine as a whole? You see, they, they, they have a lie story for this in the uh, Tariq history. There is no, uh, they are not on the place in the history. About that, all of it is lie. They are making many things for let the people do. Uh, uh, make uh, them uh,
To un uh, trust them. To trust them. They use the media for that. They use the government for that. They use many things there to make trust in this story. They are liars. There is no story in historical uh, there. They are not owners. Only in, uh, they said Sulaiman alayhi salam. Sulaiman, he is Nabi. He is Muslim. And the, the people, they are not in terms with him to Al-Quds in that time. About that, they said that the temple, this temple also is the lie. There is no temple. Only there is masjid. Sulaiman, he has built masjid. Lillah subhanahu wa ta'ala. About that, this lie, it's becoming a spirit in all the world. And they're catching all the peoples. And they make, they put one sentence for that. Or one goals, I mean. La ma'na al-Israel bidun al-Quds. There is no meaning for uh, Israel without Al-Quds. And there is no meaning for Al-Quds without the temple. This is their goals. Uh, this one, uh, government, it's working for temple. And uh, the uh, leader working for temple. Media for temple. Law for temple. All the things for temple. This is the lie and they make, make uh, state really for all the world. This one, it's lying. This one, it's lying. So what is the truth that we want to tell the world? The truth, As we Palestine? are the owners. Mm -hmm. The truth, we are the owners. From prophets. All the prophets, they come there in Palestine. They are Muslims and we are Muslims. And as you said before, we are alive together before Islam and, uh, and after Islam. We are alive. You know, I will tell you something about this point. And Nabi Sallallahu in one hadith, when he's, they ask him about the built of Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. He said, uh, Al-Masjid -Al Al-Haram, the first building. Second one, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. Between them, if the time, 40 years. Now in our Kutub Tafsir, uh, three uh, lines. First one, Adam. Second one, uh, angels, Al-Malaika. Third one, Ibrahim, the building. If anyone from this tree built Al-Masjid Al-Haram, then anyone from this, they built Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. I will tell you, ask you, where is the Sinusim in this before Ibrahim? There is no Sinusim. After that, it's coming. Then they are a lie in this one because we are the owner. Anbiya, the prophets, they are our owner. We are following Anbiya. About that, we are we must take this right and this is right for all the Muslims in the world, not for only Palestinian people. We've come almost to the end of the show. I'll give you a few minutes to wrap up, to give a very, very important message to all of our viewers about their right to the Holy Lands, uh, the Muslim right and the Muslim claim to the Holy Land. We also know that that was our first Qibla, the Qibla for Muslim people. That was the first Qibla before it was changed to Makkah. Mm -hmm. So we know how close to our hearts is um, the whole city of Jerusalem and the Holy Mosque. So in closing, what is your very strong and important message to the world, not only to Muslims, but even mm -hmm. the non-Muslims watching us this morning? Yes, uh, for, I, I speak for all the people. You must help the Muslims and the other Muslims inside Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. Uh, this is the important thing. We want some projects to do it in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Al-Mubarak. We want some programs to do in Jerusalem for these people. Because these people is underground in the life. It's very difficult life for these people. About that, if from humanity or uh, rights, humanity for all the people, you can look for us. We can look for the Palestinian people and for the J Jerusalem people also there. Uh, we must help in, in many things, many programs. The youth, the leaders, and the, all, all the people, they must uh, help these people in the Al-Quds and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa Mubarak and Palestine because we are occupied really. We are, um, uh, yani life as very difficult life. Uh, in the health, there is a problem. Education, there is a problem. Uh, in 
our life it's very very difficult really there in Al Quds and the Masjid Al Mubarak. We make dua, inshallah, that people all around the world watching us continue supporting the people of Palestine, and absolutely under no conditions should uh, the um, city of Jerusalem become the capital of Israel. Our duas and support, ongoing support to the people of Palestine. Shukran very much for being with us this morning. Salam alaikum. And that was uh, Sheikh Dr. Samir Sai talking about the situation in Palestine. Uh, we would love to have gone into more detail about the history, but unfortunately, time permitting, we were unable to do so. But at least the Sheikh has lifted the lid on just how dire the situation is out there. And we as Muslims and even non-Muslims watching us this morning need to put all of our support, our strength, our might behind the people of Palestine and it is our duty to save Jerusalem inshallah. And the final segment of the show this morning, we're talking to a professor of ethics, of all things. She's the Dean of Student Affairs at Wits University, and she comes with a long history from academia. She has lectured at um, the University of Toronto, and she's also been at uh, UCT, um, pardon, I think, at um, one of the other universities in South Africa, UNISA. That's the one. She's Dr. Puleng Lenka Bula, and and she is the go-to person for when you start university for the first time. Um, all the trials and tribulations that you're going to be going through. And it's not as easy as we might think it might be. It's a huge step. It's also a leap of faith. So for parents and for students alike, I think you should be listening closely because the transition from high school into university can be pretty overwhelming and you could lose yourself along the way. Dr. Puleng, good morning. Welcome to the program. Uh, good morning. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam. Yeah. Shukran very much for being here. It's a very important discuss discussion we should be having. And I would be kind of correct in my introduction, suggesting that it is a leap of faith and it can be horribly overwhelming for the student. If they don't get it right, they could be possibly one of the dropout statistics or really battle throughout their university life. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it is always very uh, prudent for us in higher education to state that uh, there is a gap between high school education and university education or technical and vocational training. In the sense that uh, in high school, students uh, for their academic support, they generally have an accompanying process where parents, teachers, notes and everything are provided to them. And oftentimes they also have parents, teachers and guardians uh, uh, um, advising on the decisions that they have to take. But at university, uh, there is a sense or a certain level of independence and autonomy that uh, students uh, have to grapple with. And it's also, you've just finished your matric year, you've been accepted at university, and that transition, you know, we're expecting our young people to make that overnight transition, which I have indicated could be very overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I think the question is, how prepared are they? Yes, oftentimes they're not uh, prepared for the multicultural encounter, for the diversities of uh, experiences and worldviews, whether they're religious, whether they're about identities, and whether they're about uh, multilingual uh, uh, or cultural spaces, but also the multidisciplinarities that they all face. So for instance, if you were a student who has just been looking at uh, natural sciences and have never encountered humanities or other spheres of learning, uh, it, it becomes a huge horizon that one has to find a place in. So it is important that uh, students approach uh, divisions of student affairs, which are actually the lending 
places or core curricular department that attempt to ensure that uh, students have the support in their academic pursuits, but also in their social integration within the universities. So you'd find that many universities or technical uh, uh, technicons would have uh, career counseling divisions because you may come to university wanting to do me medicine and only find that the new spheres of learning, especially in the fourth industrial revolution, there are nanotechnologies, biotechnologies, and other aspects that you never knew about and you may want to explore. So this is one division. Or you may feel like I'm new, I have to make new friends, I don't know how to make friends, I don't know how to reach out. Those are departments that help. We also have uh, departments of leadership and training because we understand that students don't only learn in the classroom, they also learn through their interaction, their aspirations to be to have a purpose in life and the leadership and development divisions are actually a company to ensure that students participate in the governance of the university. They become leaders, whether in sports or in their residences or in the academic departments or faculties where they are registered. So these are very important departments, but also sport. Oftentimes students think, if I'm good in my classroom and I just uh, get my 90s and 100s, that's all good. But uh, we're not just our heads, we're also our bodies. We have to nurture them, we have to take care of them so that there's sustained intellectual pursuit that becomes resourceful, not only for ourselves as individuals, but families and the broader society. So I think it's always important that students find that balance. So as Dean of Student Affairs, this is all uppermost in your mind. You encourage students, very especially first year students, to try and have a well-balanced life as possible. But that doesn't always happen. There are a whole host of factors that impact on their decision making as far as their first year at uni is concerned. Um, number one being all of a sudden they thrust into a world where they mean to be making all of their own decisions. In, uh, in the past, uh, just a couple of months prior to them entering university, all the decisions were made for them mm. or they were guided, lo guided along into their decision making. So here they're having to make all of the decisions. Um, they're overwhelmed by the sheer number of this cross-cultural um, village that they're exposed to. There are also issues around affordability. You speak about sport, but there's also affordability as far as their diets are concerned, which is also pretty important. Mm -hmm. If they don't eat well, they're not going to learn well. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the entire learning style is totally different from mm -hmm. school. So how do you and the other bodies, I know you have SRCs, you have all sorts of student councils, mm -hmm. and then your department student Affairs. Mm -hmm. How do you play a role in the student's life and do they come to you readily or do they only come to you when there's a problem? Yeah. Oftentimes students come when there's a problem but from orientation phase we expose them to first year ambassadors. There's a program that we've uh, created of uh, second year or graduate students or returning students who have had the experience of being a first year that hold their hand. It's more like a body system. These are the So does that actually happen? That happens. That's wonderful, so, so, so isn't it? It's matching students with a, 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 a senior student who can guide, who can, if they have um, maybe personal challenges, who can refer them to the various departments within the divisions of student affairs. And this is a program that is supported also by the Department of Higher Education, precisely because of the recognition of the transition, its challenges, its implications, but also how it helps to uh, limit large numbers of students who either drop out or who get academically excluded or who, 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 who find it difficult to, to integrate within the university. 
and it's a year-long program. It doesn't stop at orientation. Okay, I'm going to come back and pick up on where we've left off. You talk about a year-long program. How does that impact on their studies, their field of study? And just the fact that I'm so glad we're having this discussion. It kind of almost gives mom and dad that sense of relief, knowing that there's so many supportive structures in place at universities and colleges. But we'll be back in a minute or two. Dr. Puleng is my guest. She is the Dean of Student Affairs at Vist University. She's also a Professor of Ethics and it gives me great pleasure having on the show this morning, very especially for all of those first year students. Um, take heart, there are lots of support structures in place. We're going to try and unpack some of those on the show this morning and especially for mum and dads, don't worry. I think your little darlings are going to be in very, very good hands. And the final 15 minutes of the show this morning with Dr. Puleng. She is Dean of Student Affairs at Wits University. We're talking about uh, your first year at university, the trials and tribulations, not only for you as a student, but also for the people back home, for the parents who are having to fork out um, a whole host, you know, loads and loads of money. And of course, they're making an investment in your future and um, we hope and pray, inshallah, all goes well, but things can go horribly wrong. And that's when the Dean of Student Affairs steps in and all the other support structures at university. So if these are things you've been worrying about, listen closely and inshallah, you know, both you and your children uh, can take solace in the fact that there are amazing support structures in place. Uh, Pauline, coming back to you and the issue around um, support structures, do the students actually access these structures. You know, I'm thinking um, you're done with matric exams, you've passed, you've been accepted at university, there's just really two or three months before you enter the real world, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And how prepared are you? We're not sure if, you know, there's been any sort of um, orientation, exposure to people that have been to university in the past. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you know, you could be one of two types of students. And the one is Yay, I'm now, you know, um, out of the clutches of my parents mm -hmm. and it's going to be one big long party. Or you have the other student who believes that uh, he's got to make something of his life and he cuts himself off all social interaction at university and buries his nose in books. Mm -hmm. We, we often uh, try to encourage students not to, to go to the extremes in the sense that uh, the one student who is an A student, 90%, but has no social uh, uh, um, interactions that actually enable them to adapt to the changing world, it doesn't become resourceful. Even when they go to the world of work, they will find it difficult to, to really inter interface with others or to share what they've learned within the university. And the year one that you explain, who sometimes get vulnerable to substance abuses, because you would know that uh, when students go to university, they're in the age of around 18, 19, or 20, and that is the legal age of uh, drinking alcohol without asking for permission or doing other things. So we in the university, especially through campus wellness centers, try to educate students about substance abuses, their disadvantages, and how they impede the development of students. We also try to ensure that students are aware about their sexuality and really good decisions that they have to take in order to protect themselves from being vulnerable, not only to sexually transmitted diseases, but also to having maybe a child whilst you're a student. It actually makes it impossible for you to flourish. So we try to give uh, systems and resource to resource the students that they make informed decisions, they are aware of the consequences of the decisions that they take, and that they focus on their studies whilst at the same time carving a niche in some area of development, whether it's a debating society, whether it's a student group on technology, or whether it's a religious society that is advocating for some sense of justice in the world, or whether it's a, some interest in some language or something different that they would not necessarily 
uh, do or on a daily basis, but which anchors and adds on to their academic pursuit. But we also work with the faculties uh, so that when there are students who are at risk, especially academic risk, that we intervene before the end of the year or before they fall through the cracks. At the same time, when there are students who are having social problems, the nay ones, the ones who get happy, who get excited, that mom won't say, no, 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 you're not allowed to consume alcohol and so on. When they get the resources through the development and leadership uh, uh, department or through the citizenship and outreach department or through the careers counseling department, they actually then make resourceful decisions for themselves. And oftentimes they do well because sometimes mistakes are the best lessons to know what is wrong, but we don't encourage that route. We say if you have made not the best of decisions, we will still be accompaniers in the process to ensuring that we redirect you to focus on what is actually the core business of being at the university. That cultivation of knowledge, that formative aspect of being a leader, and also the pursuit for wisdom, because knowledge without wisdom may not necessarily be resourceful. You're the Dean of Student Affairs, you're also a Professor of Ethics. So in terms of people that um, obviously run into social problems at university, um, I think last year sometime we heard reports of one or two students being raped on campus. Mm -hmm. How does the issue around ethics get uh, disseminated to them, for them to understand that uh, people around you are, need to be respected, you don't have power and you have no control or can't take away the power of someone else by raping them. That must have been a big issue with uh, you at uh, Student Affairs and being a professor of ethics. It is, it is one of the, one of the sad things in our society which sometimes finds uh, some expression within higher education is the high levels of violence, especially violence against women. Sexual harassment, sexual uh, assault. And that quite, plays out a lot, does uh, it not? It plays out in institutions of higher learning as well. So what the university has done is to have uh, departments of transformation and the gender equity office. The gender equity office actually trains campaigns and also follows up when there are violations on women or men because the harassment is not only uh, in the main on women even though that's it's more persistent on women so this is the office that equips through campaigns education process accompaniment and making sure that uh, students are aware of the imperative to be protected. But we also have protection services. And you may find that within the, the residences or within the university itself, students understand how to conduct themselves. But sometimes there are students who choose or elect not to be in the university residences. And sometimes we do not have uh, the rules over the private providers of uh, residences, but we create interventions and uh, we, we interact with them in order to ensure that they have the same or quality of support systems that we put in place and to protect the students because the, the, the students who go to university, probably out of a million students who graduate from, uh, or, or, or two million students who graduate from high school, only 30% of them go to universities. So and of that you have a dropout rate as well. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show. Just very quickly, we've touched on the social aspect of university life, and it's very heartening to know that there are many support structures in place. What about academia? students struggling with academics because it's such a shift from high school to university. Mm -hmm. The style of learning and lecturing is totally different. Mm -hmm. And I should imagine in the first few months of university, students really battle to come to grips with this new style of learning. Mm -hmm. As soon as students arrive during orientation, we do assessments on their skills. In the 21st century, you would know that ICTs are very important. So as soon as they come, we assess, are they able to access uh, uh, information technology uh, resources, do they 
are they comfortable with computers so that uh, we immediately intervene because a lot of them will be doing the assignment. So uh, is language. And faculties make sure that from the first assessment that they evaluate and then put measures in place that assist. But sometimes students uh, have the resolute decision that this is the discipline that I'm going to pursue and they may not take uh, advisory. But in many instances, our students are open to being assisted and they do well when they do that. And so that's we all have we have systems. time for. Thank you so Thank you much for much. your expertise and of course we need to wrap up. Moms and dads and students alike, uh, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Amazing support structures in place on campuses. No need for you to be overwhelmed. Mom and dad, no need for you to worry. Children, our children are in good hands and of course those that go by the wayside, unfortunately we can't save them all. You're going to have one or two dropouts. But with that in mind, just know, just be at peace and till Saturday morning as always, a big thank you to the production team and from me, Julie Ali, go well and it's Khudafis. Yeah, hello, yeah, hello, yeah.